Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual re revenue and build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. In support of that mission, we've been doing these roundtable mentoring sessions for a long, long time. Uh, this is our 333rd session. We started experimenting with this format back, way back in 2008, September, when my first Entrepreneur Journeys book came out. So, um, you know, long way uh, from there. It's uh, now eight years later, and uh, 1M1M &M was launched at the, begin at the end of 2010, uh, when we first launched the curriculum and the premium program and so forth. And uh, over the years, we've worked with tons and tons and tons of entrepreneurs. And it's been a fascinating experience learning what's going on in different parts of the world and uh, figuring out what's common uh, across geographies and then what is particular in different geographies and, and bringing that insight into um, our community. And um, the other thing that has been fascinating is we have continuously brought entrepreneurs who have successfully built businesses to talk with you. And we've done the Entrepreneur Journey series for a long, long time. So it's over 750 Entrepreneur Journeys case studies on the blog. And also for the last um, couple of years, we've been having guests at these roundtables. Almost every roundtable has a guest. and. Um, Again, it's been over 100 entrepreneurs who have been entrepreneurs and investors and, and other people who can add insights into the, you know, the community's questions and, and issues. We've continued to bring that to you. So this is our last roundtable for this year. If you like tweeting the show, please use hashtag 1M1M. Follow us on Twitter at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. We publish a tremendous amount of rich content that you can learn a lot from and continuously. So, um, you know, feel free to engage with whatever subset of that content that appeals to you, and, and, but keep an eye on it. It's great content, very inspirational, and lots of educational value. One and one first and foremost is an educational program. It is not a fund. Uh, you will find recordings of all prior roundtables at the one and one roundtables channel on YouTube. And this one, today's roundtable recording, will also go there. These are the call-in instructions. Today, we will have lots of time for Q&A. So um, the call-in number is going to be 6504793208, access code 6652337201. Um, we're not quite ready for call-in yet. We're going to start today's conversation with Ernie Bray, founder and chairman and CEO of ACD, Auto Claims Direct, and uh, we'll spend at least half an hour or, or a bit more with Ernie talking about his journey, and, and there's some very particular strategic things that Ernie has done that I would like um, you to be um, you know, aware of. You may have already read his uh, entrepreneur journeys on story on um, on the blog, but today we have a chance to talk to him, and then you can also in the Q&A ask him more questions. Well, Ernie, welcome. We've, we're delighted to have you here. Well, glad to have you. Glad to be on. All right. So um, introduce our audience to ACD. What do you do? Please tell us what uh, what is the ACD business that you've built? Okay, um, what ACD does is we're a technology and services company for the auto claims industry, the property and casualty industry. So what that means is when you get in an accident, if you have car insurance, um, insurance companies have to process your claim. So what we've done is created a technology platform that integrates all the different pieces along the way and along the process uh, to streamline that for the insurance companies and their customers. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you get in an accident, your car has to be repaired. So it has to go to a body shop. Somebody has to assess the damages. Somebody has to investigate the damages. And then we've um, created a unified platform that connects everything. Very interesting. So 
you have bootstrapped this company that you started in 2004, and, and it's at mm -hmm. over $15 million in revenue at this mm -hmm. point. So I want to explore a few pieces of that process in detail. First, sure. you, you have bootstrapped, and you, one of the key strategies in your bootstrapping has been your service provider network. Please tell us how that mm -hmm. works. So what happens is when there is an accident, an insurance company needs somebody to go out there and inspect the vehicle, or they yes. need to have, you know, somebody. we have developed a um, basically an on-demand nationwide network of experts who, when these claims come in, are able to be dispatched out and assigned to go out and inspect the vehicles for, you know, various, various insurance companies throughout the country. And they then send their reports in through digital means, through digital photos, uh, their estimate information, and it's all mm -hmm. sent back to our core platform. And the network really serves as a, an extension for uh, these insurance claims office. They are able to harness the power of this whole network we have, which, which is how this works. And uh, you also in the bootstrapping strategy, you followed a very uh, powerful team strategy. Talk to us about your team strategy. Well, when I started the company out, um, frankly, I didn't, you know, didn't have the money or the means. By bootstrapping, we started basically in the spare bedroom of one of my, you know, my house, and um, we didn't have an office. We had to have a virtual environment. And so what I did was, as I brought employees on, uh, I created a virtual team. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to harness the best people I could find and not be limited to just having them sitting in an office, you know, for the sake of sitting in an office. So I was able to find some real good industry people throughout the country. So I would, you know, have people working from their homes um, in a virtual environment. But, you know, 14 years ago, there were start, some of the tools were coming into play, but we've, we've harnessed technology to create kind of a virtual, uh, virtual office. And it's really exciting. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. How many people do you have on your payroll or as contractors in this virtual team mode? Uh, in the virtual team mode, uh, we have, let's say, about 30 people right now. We have about 10 or 12 people. We're, we're expanding in our core home office. We actually now have a core home office in San Diego, uh, mm -hmm. but we still have a distributed team. That's really the core of our so business. You're doing over 15 million in revenue with just about 50, 50 people? That's correct. Awesome. So, um, I, you know, if, you, if I may, I would like to dig a bit deeper into the virtual team strategy because, and I'll tell you why I'm so interested in this. Um, okay. You know, in our community, as you know, we are very big proponents of bootstrapping. So we are huge fans of your bootstrapping success story. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and one of the things that we encourage uh, our community to do is to do bootstrapping with a paycheck, for instance. If people are, you know, starting side businesses, start validating a business while you're, uh, you still hold on to a job and the paycheck is paying the bills and so forth, um, we have no problems with this strategy and we know that we have lots of case studies of people succeeding with this strategy. And in that scenario, mm -hmm especially in general in building small businesses today, um, this kind of virtual team strategy is incredibly effective. Mm -hmm. And you can hire from all over the world. We are running basically a virtual company as well in one million by one million, and our, um, you know, our uh, team is all over the world. So we are very big believers in this uh, particular mode of scaling companies, building companies. So, um, so let's kind of brainstorm a little bit about what is it that you are doing that our community can learn from. So what functions on your team are virtual and is, are, uh, uh, you said you already have a physical office where there are about 10 mm -hmm. people. What functions do right. you choose to put in the physical office? Okay, so over time, as things grew, we had to bring in accounting. We brought our accounting functions in and some of the core management team. But mm -hmm. we actually manage much of our um, customer service and our um, quality compliance teams all virtual. So we've mm -hmm. had to integrate a full, you know, virtual phone system in the company 
Yeah. That enables okay. us to take customer service calls all throughout the country. We have people handing quality assurance throughout the country. So from our core headquarters, we have, you know, some limited staff, but it's really, really the technology. We use, you know, we use uh, programs such as Slack. We use Skype. We use um, Grasshopper for our phone system. We integrated all these different technologies to create our own way we do business. And it's, it's worked yeah. very, very well, you know, for all these years. And uh, let's talk about recruitment. What, uh, what is different about recruiting a virtual team, and how do you go about it? Well, in our industry, and I would imagine for other people, other entrepreneurs out there, in your industry, your specific industry, you want to find the best people you can. And we recruit from the industry. And what's, what we're seeing in our industry right now is there is becoming um, a situation where there are people leaving insurance companies, retiring, or maybe even just looking to leave working for a carrier, but then they still want to work in the, in the industry. So we're able to recruit people who have a lot of experience, uh, that have been in the industry for years, and the, beauty, the beautiful thing about it is they have all this, tech, you know, this um, experience, but they're distributed around the country. So we recruit, and we can find great people who have tons of experience and bring them on virtually, and we just elevate our skill sets. We elevate the experience levels of our staff really exponentially, because if you can get great people throughout the country, bring them into the fold and have them um, – in our, you know, virtual office, you know, as I would say, it really enhances our company. And the thing is, by recruiting within the industry, people hear about what we're doing, and they, I mean, we, I get, we get tons of resumes all the time. People excited to join what we're doing, and, and it's exciting. So when you, pub, when you put out a job posting out there, let's mm -hmm. say you put out a job posting on a job board or, or wherever, uh, mm -hmm. You specify that it's a virtual position that you that the person you're looking for will be working from home. Yes, if, if it's a person in that position, yes, we do. So okay. we only really we only opened a core headquarters about four years ago. Very limited, mm -hmm. just myself and a, you know a you know a few people in the office, a few admin people, and we've we've always had the intention just to keep a small little headquarters, mainly to meet yeah. clients and to. Uh, conduct business, but yeah, it's all been the virtual. And so the people who are submitting their candidacy in your company are self-selecting mm -hmm. themselves that they want to work in a virtual office mode, they want to work from home and all that, yes? Yes, that's true, exactly. And I think in, in our industry and in many industries, with the technology that's out there uh, for entrepreneurs starting businesses, realizing that you can do this, you can do it virtually now because the technology is there. Uh, I think the toughest thing we'll talk about, maybe if you want to talk about this, the toughest thing is being able to manage uh, a, a distributed work we'll team. We'll get to That's that. Let's challenge. finish the recruitment. Hold on. Let's finish the recruitment discussion. Okay. I want to ask you a, um, a, a bit more granular questions uh, on mm -hmm. the recruitment. Are there particular okay. job boards or recruitment services, online recruitment services, that specialize in um, recruiting people who want to work from home. Um, do you have any tips to offer on that? We have. Uh, we do post to some of the job sites. We have posted to some of the major job sites, and then when we mm -hmm. post the job, we advise, you know, that it is a work-from-home position, that they have the ability to, uh, you know, we look for self-starters. But, yes, we do. We use some of the major job boards to recruit that in combination with, I think another way you can leverage uh, is through LinkedIn and uh, Glassdoor. Those two sites have been fantastic because we have posted job postings there. We also have people that come to those sites. They come there and they find out what we're doing, <clears throat> and then they, uh, then they apply from, from those sites themselves. So it doesn't sound like there's an, there are any special job boards that you're using for that are no. that specialize in virtual workers. No, not any special job boards per se. It's mainly using some okay. of the traditional methods. Yeah. Okay. All right. I would say also I'll, <laughs> I'll add one thing. LinkedIn, though, we get a lot of outreach through LinkedIn. That's been a very very great platform where people are reaching out to us through there. Yeah. Okay. And how do you manage people? So in this virtual mode, talk to us about some of your 
core management strategies that help to keep all these the distributed workforce on the same page, aligned, and everything? Well, managing a team, I believe, you know, as a leader, you have to be able to inspire your team, be enthusiastic, and you have to have this team, have the team atmosphere, yet they're all distributed. How do you do that? I mean, at our core headquarters, we have little office get-togethers, we have luncheons with, you know, the small eight to 10 people. But what you have to do is you have to find a way to bring in that office feel, but virtually. One of the things I like to do is I like to do videos. I do a lot of videos. I will get on, let's say like we're talking here, I will do videos directed to the team members, to the outside virtual team, you know, motivating them, talking about some of the things going on with the company. I have very, very open communication style so they can reach out to me. They're communicating with me as the CEO of the company. And I think if you use the tools, the combinations of the technology, like I said, Slack has been huge. It's been great for us. That and really having within Slack, we have groups within Slack. So there's the team headquarters, there's uh, all these different groups. So everybody gets involved in the groups. And when somebody has a birthday, they all, you know, congregate and wish each other, ha you know, happy birthday and they post pictures. So to manage this team, you have to find a way to, to get them excited about the whole mission. And it's funny when you see all these people virtually talking to them, you know, each other all day long. And then when we bring them out to our headquarters, it's like they've already worked together all the time. And I think that's really important to keep that camaraderie up. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Our virtual team has been working together for, you know, almost eight years. And uh, mm -hmm. many of the members have been around for that long. So some of them shorter than that, but it's, you know, it's a very, well kind of integrated and gelled team yeah. that knows one another extremely well because of this very lengthy You're probably talking all day, right? You, you, you talk to each other all the time, I bet. So you just you keep that communication going. That's the thing that's fun. And, and frankly, really the essentials are email, Skype, and yeah. phone. Yeah. Everything else really, is, is kind of incidental, but I think those three are the ones that drive that. And, and Google Docs, actually, I would say Google collaboration tools is a very big one yeah. because if you're working on documents and stuff or, or you know, spreadsheets or whatever, actually, if you're working on a project a that too. requires one of those document ed uh, editing systems, collaborative document editing is a very help, very important one in our workflow. Definitely. That's, that's great. So, um, you already mentioned uh, we, about cloud services, Slack. Is there any anything else? We have already talked about Skype and Google Docs. Is there any other cloud service that, that you use in your organization to keep things uh, moving? Well, we use, I use um, Dropbox a lot. We use Dropbox among some of our team yeah. members. That's a key. That's sure. the, yeah, that's been another one. Those, that's another key one. I mean, I, our company and our cloud-based technology, we use Amazon Web Services a lot for our just our, our IT and tech department. But, but for really for the actual management of the company, a lot of Dropbox, like we said, Slack, Skype, you know, email, those are the real core, core programs when it comes to it. And is there anything particular in your, in your experience about motivating people in a virtual well, team environment as opposed to a physical environment? See, that, the biggest thing, I think, as a leader, you have to be able to get people excited. And when you're in person with somebody, you can affect and bring that energy. You come in the office, you rally everybody around, you tell them about what we have going on. But you have to do that virtually. And one thing that I make a point of doing is I call and check in personally mm -hmm. with team members all the time. Because, you know, mm -hmm. when you grow and you get big, to a certain level, even at, you know, 40 to 50 people in a company, um, a lot of things happen. You're busy all day. But when you take that time out of your day to really call people and spend individual, even if it's five or ten minutes, to talk to them, and they talk to you personally, and then you're talking to the group, like in videos, like I mentioned, um, you can transfer some of that energy to your team members. And I think that's important. It's important not to let the virtual team feel too remote. I mean, if there's a, there's a risk at times if you're not communicating all the time where they can feel isolated and you don't want to have isolation. You want to have everybody feel connected. And that's, 
really, I think, believe comes from the leadership. You have to be an, 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 you know, an excited, inter, energized person. That's what I feel like I like to do with my team, and that's what they know me for. They know I'm high energy, I talk fast, I'm excited. But I believe that when you do that, that can help inspire everybody. Yeah, and also setting the strategy very clearly of what is happening in the company, what is the game plan, yep. what is the path forward, and what is each person's role in that, um, in executing mm -hmm. on that strategy. That's a very, very key piece of keeping everybody aligned and motivated. That's right, correct. So, mm -hmm. Are you planning to expand your virtual team significantly, Ernie? Um, actually, yes, we are. As we grow, uh, we're actually right now in a really pretty big growth phase, and uh, we're ramping up quickly. And what we found out is, you know, like, like I said earlier, talent within our industry is out there. And mm -hmm. we are going to be ramping up in the first quarter of 2017 here um, with some more virtual team members. Uh, the growth that we have signed, new contracts that we've just signed, uh, has, has us, you know, in that growth mode. So we're actively, right now, even during the Christmas holiday season, we're actively interviewing and, you know, planning for that growth as we speak. So. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have another very exciting case study in the uh, virtual organization space from Ireland. The two founders mm -hmm. met virtually. One in Ireland and the other was wow. based in Uruguay, and uh -huh. uh, and they uh, they are at about 150 people right now, headquartered in Ireland. They have a little bit of a Dublin office, but but they have scaled to over 150 people, all virtual almost, except for the wow, small Ireland team. Um, and and it's you know so what I'm seeing actually is that there are companies that are scaling to sizable workforces with virtual teams and um, and the message that I think Ernie and I both would convey to those who few who are listening and considering contemplating the strategy of building your organization in a virtual mode is that there are you know this is a the flexibility of being able to hire from all over the place is very helpful and um, you know, I am based at the heart of Silicon Valley, and the thing that one of the one of the drivers for me is I don't want to fight the talent war of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is, a, is in a complete talent war. The the prices are incredibly high, the egos are incredibly high, and the competition for talent is incredibly high. So the the fact that we are willing to work with people virtually and from anywhere in the world it gives us tremendous flexibility to pull talent and to engage with talent and to work with talent from anywhere in the world. So we have people in Malaysia, in Philippines, in India, in um, all over the U.S. So it's it's been a exactly the same experience as Ernie is that there there are talented people, very skilled people in different parts of the world and. The flexibility this virtual team strategy offers you is tremendous, and it's worth considering for uh, you know a variety of situa situations and scenarios. The other point I would make is that if you are willing to do offshore, now offshore has some other challenges, time zone being one of them. Um, you also get the benefit of cost structures. So we have you know parts of our operation, parts of our you know functional areas that we can get done in at very very inexpensive price points because we are willing to work with the Philippines and and Malaysia and and so on and so forth and um, and and that's another huge advantage of going virtual. Um, so, what do you think, uh, Ernie, is the is going to change as you go from let's say 50 people to 150 people in the next few years? Mm -hmm. What do I think is going to change? Well, I think the biggest thing that as we grow, the biggest challenges is really as you scale in this industry is we're in an industry right now. I think the biggest challenge for our industry in general is that right now they have, are experiencing what I call a brain drain. 
And a lot of people are retiring from insurance companies. When I began mm -hmm. in the industry, a lot of people were very paper centric. We were trained as real generalists on the whole insurance side. There's a lot of you know, complexities mm -hmm. involved. And what's happening now is there this push towards specialization um, at insurance companies. So what they've done is they, they're hiring, you know, young people out of college. They're specialized in certain aspects of claims and insurance, but they don't have the, the broad depth of knowledge that a lot of the uh, experienced veterans have. So what's happening, what I see is going on, is that the insurance companies, in an effort to streamline operations, there's a t trend toward automation, artificial intelligence, ways to use mm -hmm. cognitive computing, but they're going to want to offshore, not offshore, obviously outsource more of the operations to companies like us. So we're going to be, mm -hmm. I believe, see more scaling up. So we're going to be able to bring some of the people who may have retired early, people who are experienced, oh. into our team. So virtual expansion is on the horizon even more. So talk a little bit about, um, you know, your clientele and um, and obviously, you have been able to bootstrap very effectively. Uh, talk a little bit about how you acquire customers and what kind of average deal sizes do you see and, and what are the key levers for growth in your business? Okay, so um, our typical client is an insurance company, obviously in the auto insurance sector. Um, but what we are, our typical deal would be in the range of a uh, you know, quarter million dollars a year to a million dollar contract. Um, mm -hmm. Some can be smaller, um, but those are the, our, our real marketing benefit to a company is the fact that when they utilize our technology, we go in, we show them how the entire workflow can mm -hmm. streamline their operations. And that's really the selling mm -hmm. point. The selling point is, when you have fragmentation in a business yeah. process, when you, every time you have fragmentation, you are putting costs, there's costs in that business that you know, people don't realize. Yeah. So our whole focus is what can we do to remove touch points, remove fragmentation and unify everything. And it's really a, very much of a challenge because some insurance companies are at different levels of their growth pattern and where they are on the technology you know, um, pattern. Some of them are just, they'll now just sort of realizing that they need to institute modern technology. Some are already more open to that. So it really depends on what the carrier is, the size, or, you know, where they're located. But really it's about our pitch is really to go in and, and, and really optimize their whole operation. Okay. And uh, when you started bootstrapping this venture, um, going back to 2004, 2005 timeframe, what enabled you to, you know, get things off the ground inexpensively and, and, you know, how did you get your first customer? Uh, can you throw some light is, on what yeah, was the so very beginning you. of your journey? Right, definitely. So when we started the company, uh, when you start any company, you don't have a reputation. You have, you know, in our business, when it comes to the technology side, we're up against, you know, a couple billion dollar companies, uh, half a billion you know, dollar companies. We also have some mid-sized companies we're up against when it comes to technology. Then on the service side, when it comes to the networks, there was a vast array of service providers, but nobody really meshed both together. So when we introduced mm -hmm. our solution into the market, it was not really something that people were used to. So mm -hmm. how did we do it? Well, here's what we did. We really focused on basically had to make cold calls. We had to go out onto uh, industry uh, trade shows. We had to basically put in the hustle out there and go in there and make ourselves uncomfortable because at first we had no experience in going there and trying to sell. I mean, selling is tough. It's tough business. And especially when you're, um, you're starting out, you know, you're going to get some um, people turning you away. And that's just the way it is. But once we landed our first deal, and I always tell people this, that sometimes the first customers you get won't be your best customers. They're going to be people who are difficult to work with and nobody else wants. So we actually got uh, inquired some of those companies, and that's where we had income coming in. We finally had income coming, which is great. We were forced to really work hard and service these clients. But I think in a way, 
it made us realize that if we could work really, really well and serve these tough clients, when we did prove ourselves to people and were able to deliver, it would make it easier. And that's really those first, I don't know, six to eight months were really tough times. I mean, that's how we mm -hmm. did it. We just had to go out there and make the calls. Mm -hmm. um, Ernie, you have a question from the audience. Surag Ramachandran is asking, nice to know about virtual mode of working. Curious to know whether you meet once in a year or so in person. Okay. Uh, yes, we bring uh, our team members in once or twice a year. Um, there's been people at different schedules. We don't bring everybody in at one time usually, but over time what we found is that people um, tend to, the virtual team bonds amongst each other. And it's so funny, you see people bonding from different parts of the country that they like, oh hey, I'd like to come out to the headquarters with so-and-so and you know these other people. So we get groups of you know four or five people who have work together in teams virtually, we get them out at one time. And then, mm -hmm. so we try to have everybody cross, you know, pollinate and meet each other at different times. But yeah, about one to two times a year. Okay. Um, folks, feel free to uh, type in your questions in the public chat. Make sure you set your chat to send to all participants. And, uh, you know, we'll continue chatting. You also can dial in at this point. So let us know. Just follow the instructions on your screen about call-in if you decide to call in. And uh, you're welcome to, uh, you know, participate by phone at this point as well. So talk about anything, uh, you know, any kind of issues that you're dealing with, you can go ahead and, um, and start asking questions on. And by the way, this is also a great time to introduce yourself. So um, since you're on the topic of virtual teams, this is a virtual accelerator. So we have people from all over the world coming to these sessions, and it's also a great time to network. So talk to, um, you know, tell us who you are, where you're dialing from, what you're working on, et cetera, as well in the process of engaging in this roundtable. Diana Servin is asking, how do you manage to pay people in different countries, taking into account the legal requirements that some countries have? Um, Ernie, do you do international? We do international. No, I can we, answer this question. You can answer that one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, Diana, you could essentially, um, we pay every, uh, all our um, international team in um, you know, PayPal, or uh, if we hired them through Upwork, for instance. Upwork is, by the way, the merged entity of Elance and Odesk. So Upwork processes all the payments um, through their system also. Um, you could do wire transfers, and, and, and you really don't have to work, uh, you have to worry too much about legal requirements if, you, if they are freelancers. And, and we, we manage we put everybody on the team as freelancers. We don't um, we don't put them on the payroll, so we don't really have to follow the hiring principles of these um, countries specifically. And that's something I would recommend, especially for international. I would recommend that heavily because, especially if you're using the hiring platform Upwork or really or similar other platforms there are other platforms like that like freelancer.com 99design for design related services there are a whole bunch of these uh, skills uh, marketplaces we use those extensively we've done tons of you know we have ongoing people who work with us for years and years and years whom we have hired from those platforms and we continue to pay them through those platforms also there are people who do projects for us uh, whom we also play, pay through those platforms. We hire through those platforms and pay through those platforms. And that's been very, very effective for us. Does that answer your question, Diana? Do you have any follow-on questions? Scott is asking, Ernie, I assume your virtual staff are all located in major urban areas. Do you have any people located in smaller markets? And if so, do you have experience, or have you experienced any tech issues? Okay, um, actually, you're, you're, most of the people we do have are in major, major areas. Uh, we have one of our co-founders, though, is in uh, Boise, Idaho, and she mm -hmm. actually, believe it or not, lives about, I don't know, 45 minutes out of town in, in a remote area. So occasionally when there's a snowstorm that comes in, um, she may encounter a little Internet uh, 
few problems with the internet, and that happens occasionally. But you know, on the whole, not very many tech issues. I mean, occasionally people's internet has problems, even in major cities. So that has not been any sort of you know in some, something that's insurmountable. Very very. And, minor and as a problems. matter of fact, I would like to add to that uh, what you said, Ernie, is that. Um, a great opportunity for building virtual teams is to hire from places that are smaller and have less, fewer local opportunities because, you know, you are competing for talent and, and being able to right. meet people where they are is a great opportunity to, you know, to be able to build a sustainable team. And, and remember exactly. always the issue of attrition, right? If you are in yep. areas that are highly competitive, you're going to lose your people. But if you're if you're going after people who, you know, who have fewer opportunities because they're in off-center places, they're in, you know, maybe some smaller towns or rural areas or whatever, but they have the skill set or they want to live in those places for lifestyle reasons. I've heard this from other people. Um, uh, there's a company that did very, very well, founded in 1999, called Right Now. Eventually, they went public. Finally, Oracle acquired them. This company was based, headquartered in um, Bozeman, Montana. And uh, the founder, Greg uh, Gianforte, told me that his hiring pitch was that there's great quality of life here. There's great fly fishing. Uh, housing is really inexpensive. And you can have fantastic quality of life. And he actually managed to move a ton of people from, you know, these very, very expensive congested areas like Silicon Valley and, and others to uh, Bozeman, Montana. So, so don't, um, don't get hung up on hiring just from the, you know, major urban areas. In fact, the big opportunity here would be to look for people who are a little bit outside of those core uh, urban centers. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Questions, comments, anybody wants to call in, ask other questions unrelated to virtual teams. If you want to ask us questions about other things, that's fine too. And uh, please do introduce yourself. Tell us where you're joining from, where, uh, you know, what are you working on, what kind of projects, what are your roadblocks? So while you're thinking about your questions, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here um, telling you about one million by one million. And um, before I do that, uh, I'm going to ask you, if you like what you do, what we do here, and, and you may have come to other roundtables and listen to entrepreneur pitches as well. Normally, we do entrepreneur pitches uh, during these sessions as well, and several of them, three to five entrepreneur pitches each session. Um, please refer um, on serious entrepreneurs to 1M1M. The reason the word serious is in bold is that it is critical that entrepreneurs have the right expectations. If you think that somebody is going to fund you to build a prototype, that just doesn't happen. The probability of that happening is absolutely zero. So you're going to need to, you know, you're going to need to have the right mindset of working really hard and bootstrapping through the early parts of the uh, company building for sure, and maybe for quite a while, and we need people who understand that and don't have unrealistic expectations that this is a quick money-making scheme. Entrepreneurship is not a quick money-making scheme. None of us who have been in this game for, for a long time uh, will mislead you to think that it's a quick money-making scheme. Um, there are a few other questions. We'll come back to questions in a moment. Uh, keep Typing in your questions, I'll pick them up as soon as I finish giving you a little bit of uh, guidance on how to use 1 million by 1 million. All the resources are at 1mby1m.com. You can start with our blog, which is free, and it's chock full of fantastic case studies, great trend information, opinion pieces, etc. It's a, it's a really solid blog that you learn a lot from, and it's been around for 10 years, or m more than 10 years, actually and has had a loyal following, and, and a lot of people have learned a lot from this. It's an educational and informational and inspirational blog, essentially. Now, out of that work, you know, I told you earlier in the uh, session that we have had entrepreneur after entrepreneur come to our Entrepreneur Journey series on the blog and tell their stories, 
shared their insights, given you guidance. We have compiled these case studies into the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, of which we have 12 volumes. So if you are interested in bootstrapping with a paycheck, you could delve into bootstrapping with a paycheck. If you're interested in unicorns, you can go look at billion dollar unicorns. You can, you know, bootstrapping using services. If you're interested in positioning as learning positioning, you can go look at the positioning book. So each of these volumes have 12 to 16 case studies and they're effectively um, good starting points to learn the 1M1M one one methodology. And the 1M1M one one methodology is very deeply rooted in bootstrapping. Our philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later, if at all. Um, these roundtables happen every Thursday almost. Uh, so today is the last one for this year, but we're going to resume at the beginning of Jan January. Next week we don't have a roundtable, but immediately as we come back in January, we are going to have another roundtable, and, and pretty much every week in January we have roundtables. We also have a full acceleration program, which is 1M1M one one Premium, and there you get extensive methodology guidance, full curriculum. It's an online curriculum that you can do at your own pace. And then you get these roundtables, but we have private roundtables for the premium members only where we do all this, you know, coaching, consulting type of work on your specific projects. We help you with business development. We help you with financing. We help you with media relations. So it's a, that the premium program is a thousand dollar annual membership fee. I would recommend that you go to the 1M1M one one self-assessment page at your convenience and really ask yourself, a set of questions that investors will ask you, good advisors should be asking you and guiding you towards. This is, these are the questions that are vital for your progression. So see how you fare in that. And if you find knowledge gaps in methodology, you can also use 1M1M one one basic, which is a curriculum only option. You can do it at your own time. It's only $99 a month and it addresses all of these different things that you need to learn, uh, core material that you need to learn to make progress as an entrepreneur. So go dig around on the website. We have tons of material on what to expect from the programs, lots, lots of video FAQs, etc. So it's not difficult to figure out, you know, if this program is for you or not. If it is, come join and we will look forward to working with you. Uh, it is a case study based program. So, you know, this, this particular session, you get an opportunity to talk to Ernie, who has, you know, done things differently, you know, and we're always looking to, to extract these unique angles and unique strategies of how people have succeeded so that you can, you know, learn from that and, and, and potentially replicate those strategies. And, and the curriculum is full of these kinds of unique insights. Our methodology is, Lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. We do have huge media clout. So if you're looking for media exposure, getting the word out about your product or service, 1M1M has a tremendous, uh, tremendously powerful ability to get the word out there about your product or service. So free roundtables coming up. Go to the website and, and register and every week in January, we have one, so hopefully we'll have a chance to work on your business. These are generally working sessions. Today's a little bit special, but generally these are all working sessions where we take one of your projects, you know, maybe three of your projects, five of your projects, and, and we will work on your projects. So back to questions. Um, let's see. Maurizio Candiani is asking, operating remotely has all the uh, I lost it. Positives you've mentioned, but it has some challenges that I would like to address. How do you handle the learning curve? It normally takes longer to bring someone new up to speed when you're working at a distance. Ernie, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, one of the things we do is when we hire somebody, we often have to bring them out to the headquarters when they start. So then they get about a week or so uh, with our team, even if they get a few days, if they can get some of the um, experience at the headquarters, uh, be there with me in person and our team, that's a great way mm -hmm. to get them set, you know, on the right foot. There's times when if the person's already really skilled in that position, uh, we do a lot of virtual training. It may even be just like we're having this um, 
conference right now, we do some virtual uh, meetings and bring up the speed. Yes, to some degree, there is a little bit of a learning curve, um, but if you have good training programs from the beginning, and if your business is not very, very complex, you can do a lot of it virtually. But you know, sometimes we like to have people come out at least for a few days to the headquarters. You know, Maurizio, in my experience, it has not been more um, cumbersome or more difficult to bring people, bring new people up to speed. We have very, very clear processes, and we have very clear documentation of those processes. So um, it's not at all difficult to bring people up to speed if you follow clear communication principles. The one thing I would, one caveat I would say is that virtual teams work if you have good communicators on your team. Both the leader as well as you know, all the people in the team need to be good communicators. And if you don't have good communicators, there's gonna be problems. But that's true about all teams, actually. Yeah. Okay, Scott has another comment. I am an executive coach based in Austin, Texas. Um, one of my largest projects now is assisting a local business owner with scaling his business. He has a good deal of fear around the kind of issues under discussion here, and this content will be very helpful to him. Great, Scott, you'll find the recording of this on the YouTube channel, so you can definitely point him to, uh, to the material. Maurizio is asking, how do you keep productivity at its best? best? Ernie, why don't you take that? Well, I think productivity is you gotta measure with numbers. Um, we monitor phone stats, we monitor uh, activity in our technology platform. So when we have the virtual teams working at home, we can see the activity that they get done in a day. So we're monitoring phone stats and we're monitoring files viewed, uh, notes entered, claims they're handling. So we have our own internal metrics that are built into our systems that allow us to see the productivity. So for example, if somebody's not answering phones or in their files, you can tell that they weren't productive. I mean, I'm a person, I don't like to be a micromanager because mm -hmm. you have to remember when you do have people working virtually, uh, there's a, a large level of trust that has to be uh, involved in that relationship. So that's really, it's, it's really important. And um, you can manage with the numbers and then giving people the tools to get the job done giving them the direction, clear direction, and then letting them uh, excel is what I'm all about. And that's what I like to do. But yeah, you have to uh, manage that productivity by some, some numbers. Great. Scott um, comments on his biggest, on his clients who's, a, who's trying to grow his business. His biggest issue is one of trust, not being there physically with the person, knowing more about people like Ernie is great, remote, remote work is effective. And Maurizio Candiani is saying, correct, Scott, trust is the starting point. You still have management challenges to maximize results. Any comments on this will be useful. Greetings from Mexico City. Um, so, you know, one of my learnings in, um, in doing something virtual at a very large scale, you know, one million by one million has a community of over 300,000 people. Um, and we, you know, we touch these people. They're not all our clients. They're not all our team members, obviously. There are various different kinds of stakeholders. We have a lot of readers of our content, a lot of free users of our roundtables. These roundtables have had, you know, probably 75,000 plus people coming to them, them over the years. Um, so we, we, you know, we interface with a lot of people and we use a lot of uh, transparency techniques, so communicating with them regularly, like the fact that we have every single roundtable, this is a 333rd roundtable, every single roundtable recording is transparently available on, uh, on YouTube. So if you follow a few of these roundtables, you will get to know us, you know? And it's such a no-nonsense, no-bullshit kind of, we are here to work together, it's a working session, we bring you interesting people, uh, you know, high caliber people like Ernie and, and so forth. So it's a, it's a, that trust we have been able to build with transparency. So I, I would say transparency, maintaining good communication, transparent communication is one of the great uh, trust building mechanisms. Do you agree with that, Ernie? Oh yeah, totally, I agree 100%.
Um, what, one thing I wanted to touch on real quick <clears throat> about the virtual teams um, is so funny is because it really goes back to that communication. You have to realize that your team, like right now as we're having this meeting, people are trying to contact me as it is. Um, you want to be as open as possible that the minute you're not available to your team, you're going to find that the team loses that connection, that connectivity. So my uh, one piece of advice is really find ways to include everybody on the outside, especially if you have an headquarters, because you don't want to have people feel as though there's a an inside team where you're at and mm -hmm. they feel left out. I think it's very important to always remember managing teams is to try to really include everybody in everything. That's mm -hmm. just a really important thing. Very good point. Rajesh K is saying, small introduction, great meeting here, folks, very informative. Shramana saw your video in LinkedIn, and I'm very impressed. Inspiring is the journey to help entrepreneurs around the world. I was bootstrapping my idea, and I don't, didn't even know it was called bootstrapping. <laughs> Currently, I have a team working offshore building my website. I do use a website called Fiverr for stuff such as logo creation and documentation, etc. Yes. Fiverr is another option. 99designs is another one for logo creation kind of stuff. Very, very popular. Um, he's also asking you, Ernie, what CRM has worked best for you? Well, right now we're using HubSpot uh, for our primary um, tool. I mean, we've used this Salesforce. We've tried other ones. Um, but I think the smaller you are, keep it simple. Keep it as simple as possible. And but right now, we, our team is using HubSpot as our core CRM tool. So Scott, we use Zoho, and and it has worked perfectly fine for us. So and Zoho is very inexpensive. Uh, in fact, I think the thing you, is. Uh, go sorry, ahead. So the thing is, keep it keep it as simple as what whatever works for you and you find you're comfortable with. You know, you can stick with that. Don't be you know feel like you have to use something that's expensive because that's right. what everybody uses. Right. Just find something that works. And by the way, an aside, Zoho is a fantastic bootstrapping story itself. It has taken no outside financing ever, and um, it is currently at over $500 million in revenue. So it's a very, very yes. impressive company, and we have covered this case study extensively. So if you're interested in um, you know, looking at that case study, it's a very inspiring case study. Sundar Nathan is asking, is it possible to have virtual teams in fields such as architecture or, say, in providing psychological support across geographies? I don't see why not. I don't see why not at all. You know, this whole business of, um, you know, marketplaces, skill-based marketplaces is becoming very, very common and very popular. So you could, you know, you could look at, look to see if there is any kind of skill-based marketplace where you can find, recruit people of a certain background or a certain kind, or find or start one. You know, if there is none in the, in the architecture field and that's your field of interest, that could also be a, uh, a field where you could start a marketplace like that. It's a good business idea. Um, Hari Rastogi is asking, I'm for attending first time, I like it very much. I run CXO Club, which is an elite network of 1,000 plus CXOs in India. Great, excellent. Welcome, Hari. And Kunal is saying hello to fellow bootstrappers. Kunal, what are you working on? Attending for the first time, run an online-based consultancy and training for skill-based subjects. Now I'm planning to launch an Azure-based virtual counselor for international education. Okay. Good. Anybody else? While you're typing in more questions, let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson on the 1M1M team. If you have questions about the program, if you're contemplating joining the program, and if you would like to discuss with somebody, have questions and so forth, first dig around on the website and then contact Irina and she'll be happy to answer your questions. Any other questions, comments, introductions? There are a lot of people in the room. I'm actually very happy to see that so many of you showed up for, you know, just the pre-Christmas week roundtable. <laughs> we have Christmas in a couple of days. 
Good now, Faith. So I was wondering if Ernie could tell me how to coordinate work across different time zones. Ernie? Sure. Um, that's something we definitely have to do because uh, a lot of uh, our clients, the insurance companies, have core headquarters and offices based in the East Coast all the way out to the West Coast where I'm at. So we stagger our uh, teams and um, mm -hmm. have different people work on different shifts and schedules. So that's one of the, the key things you have to do is you have to just take those time zones into consideration. And some people come in earlier, some people come in late, there's people who want to work different, um, different work schedules. But if you can coordinate that around your work hours, that's how we do it. So, you, you know, that's why we have some people on the East Coast that handle that side, but you just got to arrange that. And I've, uh, you know, ha had time zones to manage all through my career, um, not just in 1M, 1M, but all through my career I've had operations, offshore operations, and so on and so forth. Um, so I've managed uh, time zones all through my career. And, uh, you know, you kind of have to find, depending on which time zones you have to manage, you kind of have to understand people's work habits you know, those, the people that you're trying to work with, what are their con convenient times, and, and you kind of create habits, you know. Like, for us, we have certain times that are scheduled times for sync-ups, right? For, um, for some of my colleagues on the East Coast, we do a 9 a.m. Pacific time sync-up. At eight on Monday mornings, at 8:30 a.m. Pacific time on Monday mornings, I do a sync up with some of my team members in India because there, you know, we get a, some amount of overlap time. Um, we have similar, you know, assigned time zones for sync up with Singapore, Malaysia, etc. So um, I think having some a, a common, you know, recurring time every week when everybody who is in that time zone and, and that time suits you are going to commit to doing a sync up is one habit that I would strongly recommend that you enforce and implement in your organization. Sundar Nathan is saying thanks. We will have virtual robotic workforce soon. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I still think there's, there's, there's you still, you still got to have that human touch a lot. That's one thing we talk about. That you, you can. Uh, that's one of the things in our industry we see that you know how much automation is going to go on in all these different businesses throughout the world. I mean, you, you see artificial intelligence. You see this coming into play, but I still think that you're going to have people want. There still needs to be that human interaction. There still is that place for, for that. So. You know, that's really like even insurance. People want to do self-service, but when uh, things don't work out right, you still have to have people. So it's, it's going to be some very different dynamic times, I'm sure, in this whole world we're seeing, definitely. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. So you can't hear me. Oh, I can hear you now. Now I can. Huh? We're that's back. weird. So, uh, so Kunal's question was: Can you also please elaborate how do you manage payroll considering the currency dynamics? And I responded to that question by saying we pay in U.S. dollars and we don't really do anything any adjustments depending on currencies? Any other questions, folks? All right, well, Ernie, thank you very much, and thank you for staying the whole hour and, and uh, interacting with our uh, audience. It was a pleasure having you and it was very insightful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. Um, everybody, in those who celebrate, those who don't celebrate but are still enjoying the holidays, have a great time. Get some rest. Get some family time, good food, etc. And we will meet you back here in early January. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming, and we will continue to 
Use these working sessions to make progress on all your businesses. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.